Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining our webinar today. Federal grant windfall situation. We're excited to have everybody joining today and um, we'll do introductions um, in a minute. Melissa, if we can pull up the slide deck that we're gonna share with everyone today. So again, you're joining uh, <clears throat> Navigating the Federal Grant Windfall um, webinar. And uh, you know, the goals to really kind of try to discover, you know, the tribal priorities. Um, you know, it's working on stretching relief funds, uh, finding new sources of funding, um, a focus on creating kind of shovel-ready projects, and really increasing your grant writing capacity. Because um, at the end of the day, we know it's about um, getting these grants kind of written, and yet that's probably where you know kind of the um, the smallest part of the funnel is, I'm sure, um, with that capacity. So we'll be talking through some of these things today. Great, so just wanted to take a chance to meet the panelists. And so um, um, with that, um, we'll start with our, our chairman and CEO, Jamie Fulmer. Jamie, if you wouldn't mind just um, I'm running through introductions of the panelists for us and introducing Bluestone, that would be great. Sure, good morning, everybody, and appreciate you taking the time this morning. My name is Jamie Fulmer. I'm the chairman and CEO of Bluestone Strategy Partners, and I'm a Apache, a, a proud member of the Yavapai Apache Nation located in Camp Verde, Arizona, and I uh, was honored to serve my tribe as tribal chairman many years ago now. Um, I served two terms as an elected leader, and we had term limits in our constitution. And um, uh, after the two terms, uh, John Moores, our, our president at Bluestone and I co-founded Bluestone Strategy Partners, and we've been working exclusively in Indian country ever since then, and uh, proud and honored to have served over 200 tribes, and really excited about this morning and the opportunity to have um, our, not only our um, team, but also honored to have uh, two tribal chairmen uh, that are joining today. and. Isaiah Vinvanko, the chairman of the Saboba Band of Mission Indians is, is joining us today, as well as Ron Allen from Jamestown Sklallam Tribe. And, and we're really honored that they were, were willing and able to join us because it's a nice cross section of, of uh, you know, the, the tribe in the Northwest and where Jamestown Sklallam's at and the tribe in Southern California where uh, Saboba Band is located and, and also with our team being able to get a, a national perspective. And so we felt like the, the opportunity is really, uh, uh, is the right time for us to be able to share some of what we've learned in addressing the, um, the issues and, and, and challenges with the pandemic, as well as the funding that's come through, both beginning with CARES Act and now with ARPA and the infrastructure funds. So we look forward, we also, with the, the events being moderated by Jason Mancini and Jason is our national project manager. We also have joining and running the, uh, the responses and the, uh, the technology with uh, Melissa Thompson, our senior project manager. And as I had mentioned earlier, John Moore is the president of Bluestone. And so Jason, just uh, I'll turn the time back over to you to moderate and just honored to have everybody joining this morning. And we look forward to um, providing you some insight and some thought leadership around ARPA and, and getting some tribal leader perspective as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Appreciate that. Um, Melissa, any just kind of um, just feedback on just um, or just on process as far as question and answers, how that's going to work today? Yes. Uh, good morning. If you have any questions you wanna pose, please use the Q&A button down at the bottom. Um, our team here on the panelist side and host side will get that and be able to respond. And then also just uh, the recording for the webinar will be shared out once we're finished here um, and a follow-up email probably tomorrow. So the webinar is being recorded. Perfect, thanks, Melissa. We can go to the next slide. One thing about just Bluestone is we've you know, got about 15 core service offerings. Um, the bulk of what we do is planning um, for both, um, um, you know, both um, governance and also um, economic development. So a lot of planning, but specifically you can kind of look at the core service offerings that, um, you know, Bluestone 
um, <clears throat> offers, and we've been doing this for 16 years now, and so uh, we get to wake up every day and um, work in Indian country, so excited about and passionate about um, ARPA and the opportunity it brings, um, I think, to tribes, you know, across the nation. Uh, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so when we talk about, you know, ARPA, the thing that we hear probably the most is more than, you know, 32.8 billion being infused into tribal communities. And for some tribes that we work with, it was a little bit overwhelming. I think, you know, the landscape of how the funds were distributed, um, you know, the different, um, you know, entities that it went through for, um, you know, being able to um, access these dollars was confusing. And so when we talk about the 32.8 billion, though, we want to talk first from the big picture point of view of it being, you know, just an incredible opportunity. So if we can go to the next slide, um, <clears throat> we'll see, you know, kind of how that was laid out. And I'd like to go to our president, John Moores. And John, when you think about the 32.8 billion, and we've got a little red box around the 20 billion, maybe you could, you know, help describe as we see it in the landscape of this funding, um, you know, how that's different than, you know, these other boxes of opportunities. Uh, thank you, Jason, and uh, welcome to all the uh, attendees this morning. So the, uh, the 20 billion, as you all know, was uh, formula-based distributions of uh, two federally recognized communities. They, uh, there was a minimum of $1 million uh, given to, to each a federally recognized tribe. And then from there, there was a formula based upon 65% and 35% in two different distributions based upon the size of the community, the, the land base and, and their, uh, uh, their economic uh, employment. So the uh, that that's given, and uh, you know the the ARPA funds, unlike the CARES Act funds, have great flexibility. And uh, when I say that, uh, I'd like to use the term of of gold. And gold is transferable in any currency, as we all recognize. And so, ARPA funds, for the most part, have tremendous flexibility on where the tribe. There are requirements, so we can get into that but they're, how they use it, when they use it, and what they use it for, uh, definitely the tribes have more control over that than previous funding. Uh, then, then came along uh, $12.8 billion of additional funding. And let's refer to that as, as silver for right now. It's very valuable, it's important, it's necessary, but it, uh, unlike gold, it, it, uh, in this particular example, it, it can only be used for the purpose it was received. So uh, for ARPA funds could be used for economic development or stabilizing a tribal economy, workforce development, uh, healthcare, housing, et cetera, et cetera, which we'll show examples of. However, the, the 60 plus other funding opportunities at a federal level that has come to Indian country, again, totaling up to a little over $12 billion, is specific for a purpose. So you can see here there's native language, there's combat domestic violence, there's housing initiatives, there's education programs, there's health systems, and it goes on and on and on. And But once you pursue those, which are very important, you have to use those funds for as they were received. ARPA has so much flexibility uh, as, as a comparative that ARPA can be used to supplement, it could be used to add on, it could be used to pay for these initiatives directly. It could actually even be used for an advance to get these projects started and then repaid in many cases back to the, uh, back to the tribal government uh, once you receive program dollars. So a lot of flexibility, a lot of opportunity, but we're in uncharted waters. And so the key point here is, is that what's the strategy? What's the plan to leverage your ARPA funds? We believe ARPA funds should be used last as not first. We believe that other than taking care of the community members themselves and in direct you know, high priority initiatives, a lot of the other programs and departments and economic initiatives could very well be funded through these secondary or, 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 or program specific dollars and use those precious ARPA funds to either supplement or have a reserve because uh, 
they have the most flexibility. And there are communities out there that, that received their ARPA funds and immediately spent those without a planning process, without a structured approach, without understanding in many cases what the opportunities to leverage ARPA dollars to actually go use and pursue these other non-ARPA dollars and really increase the amount of funds by a multiple that the tribe has access to. So thank you, Jason. Yeah, thanks, John. It's a great, I think, strategy. We're going to talk a little bit about strategy. <clears throat> um, Jamie, you've been in Indian country for a long time. You were um, chairman of your tribe um, for consecutive terms. Have you ever seen this kind of opportunity in Indian country before? And what have you been, you know, telling tribes if you talked to them about this opportunity? Um, when I was chairman, this is, you know, now 20 plus years ago going on my first term in office was unheard of there wouldn't even you know this kind of dollars coming to indian country was not even a consideration at that time you know it was always struggling to find funds for every little thing that you did and those tribal leaders that are that are uh, have joined the webinar you and that have been around know what i mean with that the one thing i will say about that is there's a lot of dollars in indian country but because of the impacts on the greater uh, economy, I don't believe that this will ever happen again in our lifetime. At least, I don't. There's just not enough money in the federal coffers, you know, especially with them investing in a war and overseas as well. So, although it's a lot of dollars that have come into Indian country, it's really important that the tribes that are are utilizing and leveraging every opportunity to get those dollars. And, and to to support the opportunity to to build out the the infrastructure and the the programming and the, the housing and all of the supportive services that can be leveraged through the funding that's come through in the ARPA and now the infrastructure bill and and um, just recognizing that uh, you know I don't foresee that this will ever these kind of dollars will ever come into Indian country again and in, in the near future, for sure, and uh, perhaps you know never again with regards to the economy. Uh, I will say that um, to John's point that he opened up with with the 20 billion that's gone in, those tribes that have have already started their planning and have really looked at how best to leverage that ARPA, congratulate you and and now is the time to really start looking at those additional non-ARPA direct funds, the the other funds that are outlined in this screen. And and we've been working with tribes uh, throughout the country right now for the last since ARPA came out around you know set, developing plans to to uh, maximize the opportunity for these additional funds as they're going to be the building blocks for that for the for the next near future as well as potentially for the next generations to come. So really, my comment to tribes and and. If tribal tribal program heads and tribal leaders is that you know look at these funds critically and and see how best you can uh, maximize your opportunity to to go out and and capture these funds. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Chairman Vivanco, when you think about just you know when you saw these funds kind of being released and and coming down the pipeline and knew that they would you know, come in, there, some of them would be directly distributed out and some you're going to have to kind of, um, you know, competitively go and get, you know, what was your kind of initial kind of reaction as far as the opportunity that, um, you know, this could present itself for, for your tribe? Uh, we, we were excited, but at the same time, kind of curious as to what any um, restrictions there would be on these funds. As you know, with the CARES Act, there wasn't clear guidance and there was a lot, of, there wasn't a lot of flexibility with those dollars. So, being able to, to use what had come down the pipeline in the first go around was something that we had to step back and really look at and how can we best utilize these funds to make sure that we're addressing the needs of our, of our community and our tribe. That was first and foremost. And then as we got further into it with ARPA and the infrastructure bill, it became, it became a plan. You know, let's start planning for what could be coming this way. And then when it did come our way, we were a step ahead of the game with our planning and making sure that we could uh, maximize the use of any funds that came our way and, and really address our needs. Yeah, really good. And what do you think, just a follow-up question, how important do you think this funding is in general, just 
opportunity for Indian country as a whole? It's huge. Uh, you heard it here this morning. Uh, Jamie just mentioned it again. I don't think that it'll ever happen again. You know, it hasn't happened up until our this point. Um, I don't believe it will happen again, but it's here now. And it's time for us in Indian country as a whole to, to maximize its value. And I, I know every tribe out there has needs and be it housing, infrastructure, uh, higher education, just health, whatever the case may be. There are dollars out there to address these issues. It's up to us as tribal leaders to go out and make sure we're maximizing our best uh, effort to, to put forth and, and grab these funds and these dollars. Yeah, really good. <clears throat> we can go to the next slide, Melissa. <clears throat> um, basically, yeah, on top of all that, we've got the uh, you know bipartisan infrastructure law um, passed the House, the $15 billion in direct funding. Um, you know, largest resource in U.S. history, addresses a lot of infrastructure needs in Indian country around climate change, a lot of, you know, water, wastewater um, type of dollars that are out there, public transportation, you know, broadband, road maintenance, and <clears throat> all we do is work in Indian country, and we know that, uh, that tribes need this type of infrastructure support. Uh, but to be able to leverage this infrastructure support, there's got to be some planning, there's got to be some shovel-ready you know, kind of projects in place. Um, John, as maybe some people are, um, you know, joining this and, and realizing, wow, we haven't really addressed or begin to plan yet. I think, you know, some tribes, you know, are asking, um, is it too late? Is it too late at this point to take advantage of these opportunities? So the answer is no, uh, it's not too late. Uh, to give you an idea, there are uh, over 90 grants closing between now and December 31st, representing $1.1 billion to Indian country. So uh, yes, there is opportunity, but, but time is ticking. Uh, the, the federal government did not take into consideration, uh, we believe to its fullest extent, the impact on the pandemic uh, to Indian country and thus the inability to quickly respond to deadlines that were set by Treasury to expend these funds and then come out with 60 plus other funding opportunities that in many cases are brand new to Indian country with new regulations, new application processes, new reporting processes, uh, and then bring on another 15 billion in, in new opportunities on top of that to an already short uh, uh, you know, shortened workforce due to COVID and, and temporary closures in some cases still enacting with throughout governments, it's been a challenge. And so is it too late? No. Uh, are there deadlines passing basically daily? Yes, there are. Uh, but th this is the time. If you haven't started the process or if you're if you're in the middle of the process, this, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity that needs to be acted upon. And I'll give you an example that it's not, it, the, the impact of what we're seeing to all this new funding is that some traditional kind of historical funding agents uh, from the federal government uh, through a standard application process are not being pursued just because tribes are overwhelmed. So, you know, we're seeing a great decline in applications for many funding opportunities. There are a few that have been oversubscribed, but the majority are not. And so that means that even the smallest tribe, the most rural tribe, has an equal opportunity to go pursue these funds. But it is a structured planning approach that needs to be considered. Um, there is a lot of opportunity but uh, you notice at the bottom of this particular slide, the asterisk, shovel-ready planning projects are a priority. And this, this started in the Obama administration where they wanted, the federal government wanted to see some immediate impacts of the, of the funding. And so they, they uh, uh, gave special uh, awards or special preference, if you will, to those projects that were shovel-ready. So they weren't just concepts on paper. They knew exactly where the project was going to be built. They understood the cost. There was the engineering and architectural and pre-construction work done. There was the understanding of the impact, uh, clearly understanding of the various funding sources and how it was going to be administered within the, within the tribal government. And these are getting preference. These are getting preference not only in the infrastructure side, but 
the more planning that can be put forth, the better the opportunity for the award. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, John. And Chairman Vavanko, when you think about the impact that the infrastructure bill can have on, you know, your tribe specifically, what are some of the, um, you know, existing kind of infrastructure projects and needs that you're hoping to accomplish? Well, we, we've, thankfully, we've had a history of great leadership that have looked at our needs as a tribe and said, hey, you know, we need to put planning together for these future projects in hopes that we can one day fund them. So we, we've gone out and done all the legwork and got things ready for what's important for us is housing. And, and what comes with that is requiring a wastewater treatment facility, upgrading our water system, uh, even maybe solar arrays, um, ex expanding upon our brand bo uh, broadband connectivity that we do have currently, putting all those into play. And then once the opportunity came through the infrastructure bill to fund these projects, we ourselves thought, okay, we're in a good position. We have projects that would be deemed shovel ready and are really going after those. So I think identifying your tribe's needs and what's important at that moment, and then really progressing upon that to make sure that you are ready for when these grants do come out, you're in a position to take advantage of. Yeah, thank you, Chairman, appreciate that. We can go to the next slide. So with this slide, you know, there's a treasury example uses of funding. And Jamie, I think as we've worked with, you know, tribes, we've seen that, you know, some tribes are maybe a little um, <clears throat> just, you know, apprehensive about moving forward, about maybe having to feel like, man, I don't know if we can, you know, get, um, you know, projects in place that are approved by treasury. We don't have to send money back. What's kind of your advice to tribes that maybe haven't moved forward or aren't moving forward because they're worried about, you know, how the funds might be used? Always as a, as a, a tribal leader, former tribal leader, I think about the idea of sovereignty and the importance of expressing sovereignty. These funds were, were allocated from treasury to the sovereigns of, across the United States of in nations, tribal nations, and the importance of this is they, they set up these, this broad framework. And what really becomes important is, is making certain that as you plan forward, as using the ARPA direct funds, that you're thinking about maybe alternative uses beyond the pandemic and beyond the here and now. And to Chairman Vivanco's comments around, you know, be that strong leadership team that builds the planning for the future. So at the very least, I, I would recommend to all tribes that you develop some plans for a vision for the future. And, and you can utilize the funds for planning for, you know, the rebuilding of your economy, the rebuilding of your economic engine, the rebuilding of your programs to support your community members, and then also the direct services that you have for your membership. So it really becomes important to look at these broad uh, buckets that Treasury developed and, and think of what can fit in there today that you could also at some point change or expand in the future. And a perfect example would be water and sewer, as Chairman brought up. You know, maybe it's initially planned to, to for you know 10 housing units, but maybe the thinking is around we'll do the planning for a hundred housing units. And so that you have those shovel ready plans in place going forward to be able to implement if and when the money comes and then be able to also showcase a, a shovel ready plan so that you have more opportunity to reach out to the new grants. The other thing I would suggest on the ARPA funds just in closing on this is that really thinking about not just the impacts of, of what you're going to develop, but the impacts of once it's developed, what, it, what kind of impact will it have on the tribe as far as staffing needs, as maintenance needs, oversight needs, uh, training and development needs for your people. And so there's a sequencing of events that should happen in this process. So it's a planning funnel where you're thinking about the broad uh, vision of the future and you're narrowing down into here and now, and then leveraging the ARPA to plan, and then also do those immediate ne necessary uh, areas to address the needs of the community, 
while also thinking about how to protect and build for the future. Yeah, really good. Thanks, Jamie. <clears throat> we can go to the next slide. John, when you think about um, maybe just, you know, with that being a little bit more creative. So one way to look at it is, you know, treasury's kind of handcuffed me. Another way to do it is, okay, how do I work around, you know, kind of some of that guidance, that general guidance and get creative maybe um, when it comes to, you know, looking at how to, um, you know, use fiscal recovery funds. Thank you, Jason. And th there is a lot of creative ways within the boundaries of Treasury to, to leverage the funds. And uh, we get questions uh, every day from our, our travel clients on whether it's, you know, subsidizing salaries or capacity building investments that are necessary. And I think that's one thing that that um, when you're looking at which projects you would like funded, one of the main things that need to be considered is what's the internal capacity and requirements to actually fulfill the implementation or, or if it's a construction project, the development of that initiative. So it's not just money. And, um, and so, you know, tribes are being very creative in looking at not only the, the definitions and uses uh, of the dollars based upon the availability, but how do you use state level dollars tied to federal dollars, tied to ARPA dollars to actually pay for these programs and, and these projects that are, that are priorities? And uh, the capacity piece is something that we're seeing as is a significant gap. Uh, if you think about that, you know, on a regular basis, uh, an average tribe, and I'll just use average as a, as a loose definition, is, you know, anywhere from 15 to 25 grants a year. Well, there's literally hundreds of grants. There are over 90 closing in the next six months. And so there needs to be a very thoughtful strategic planning process to not only address the creativeness of, of what funds could be available in conjunction with state and federal initiatives, but also internally, how are those projects, if they are funded or if they decide to be funded by, by tribal government, how are they actually going to be implemented? And I think uh, capacity building is, is uh, something that is of, uh, of great concern because what are the departments that are most impacted through this? HR, workforce development challenges that exist, not only in retention, uh, but a recruitment of, of qualified staff in, in training to support that. And then you've got finance. Finance is a second uh, department that is, is highly impacted by this because of the amount of uh, scrutiny that's required in, in many of the reporting uh, funding applications put in, in the, the awards that are handed out, but also just the ability to manage the financial aspects of these projects. You're dealing with tens and in, in some case, hundreds of millions of dollars for tribes in newly created responsibilities, newly created reporting requirements in a very short timeline. And then the other is the grants department, right? And the grants department is they're used to be creative, right? They're used to figuring out ways to position projects uh, that, that are best and able to be funded. And one thing about, you know, the Bluestone approach to this planning is, is that we look at not only all the available funding, but what are the creative uses of those funds to meet the tribal council goals you know, based upon the community's priorities? So it is a process and, and there is, there's a lot of room for interpretation, uh, but uh, if, it's, if it's properly done and there's good guidance, uh, the, outcome can be, the outcomes can be significant for tribes. Really good, John, thank you. <clears throat> Melissa, if we can go to the next slide and talk strategy a little bit. And so, as we know, the direct distribution funds, you know, all tribes receive that at various levels based on, you know, basically the size, right, um, of the tribe. And so, <clears throat> John, we work with, you know, all, all sizes of tribes and we work with some smaller tribes maybe that got, <clears throat> a, you know, a less, a lower amount of the direct distribution funds and maybe feel like they can't do as much with ARPA but maybe talk about this strategy a little bit, just to talk about how you can leverage those funds, how you can maximize the funding opportunities to really grow your ARPA opportunity. 
Yeah, thank you. So ARPA was, CARES Act was, you know, dictated, uh, as, as the chairman mentioned, as far as the types of requirements and the timeframes and so forth. Then ARPA came along with, with the ability, a longer three-year timeframe for allocation of those funds, but uh, much more uh, 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 room as far as how they could be used. And, but there was still, and, and for many tribes, it's a small amount of money. In some tribes, it was a large amount, but, in, in, but they have larger needs. Overall, ARPA is a drop in the bucket for what tribal communities actually need to stabilize and grow their communities in all aspects from community development, economic development, health, uh, education, et cetera. It's a drop, of, a drop in the bucket as far as the needs uh, that, that, are, that are there. And we know that, right? But then came along the non-ARPA dollars. And so that was the first, that's to us, that's the great equalizer, right? And why is that is because all tribes are able to submit applications for awards, federally recognized tribes. So now you have this pool of, of $12.8 billion that it's, it's, the, it's the sovereign right of a federally recognized tribe to pursue each and every one of those awards, right? And so how do you do that? Well, uh, the strategy is, is to take a small amount of your ARPA funds. I'm gonna use the example of 20%, which many tribes have done, and use that 20% to do the planning necessary from the, from the uh, uh, shovel ready preparedness, to the proper implementation planning internally, to looking at your capacity building and what it's gonna to take to retain employees and promote employees and attract employees. What is it gonna to take to build out your finance department and your grants department? And what is it gonna to take to submit the applications necessary to win these awards? So take 20% of funds and set those aside for those types of activities and all the, planning that we're talking about are justified and authorized ARPA expenses, right? So they're all authorized expenses. In fact, the federal government wants you to plan, wants you to be prepared. You know, the, there's, a, there's a, a lot of uh, potential risk if you don't. And so they're, they're encouraging planning, they're encouraging process development, they're encouraging looking at capacity building of which we're talking about today. But then let's identify the federal funds that are available to fund your, your programs and projects that are directed at the council level and throughout, and throughout your community. Let's set those ARPA funds aside. Let's do sound planning. Let's do it efficiently and quickly. And now let's go after a much larger pool of funds. So you're taking 20% of your ARPA funds and you're going to relay that or leverage that into a much larger opportunity of pool of non-ARPA funding. Then the second bucket that came along and which was a win, potential windfall for tribes is that when the Biden administration distributed ARPA funds to the states, they actually classified tribes as an equal in the process. And why that's important is because states are required in developing tribal programs that can access state ARPA funds. And so we're seeing the state of Minnesota example, seven solid programs are being developed and implemented that give the Minnesota tribes uh, uh, an opportunity to access state funds that they didn't have access to before in addition to the state grants. Then came along the infrastructure, as I said. And so You've got these, if, you're, if you look at your, your goal of being the ARPA and you take 20% of that, and now you look at, wow, look at, look at the, the three major buckets of funding from federal non-ARPA dollars, which are the 60 plus programs I spoke of, 12.8 billion. Then you look at the state funding programs that are available and still being announced, by the way, so time is not too late there. And, and, and now you've got the infrastructure bill which is now um, uh, 15 billion, which is a five year window of allocation. You're now taking a small amount of ARPA funds and leveraging them into much, much larger funding opportunities. 
And now we could really make a dent into the priorities and the needs of communities throughout Indian country. So that strategy is driven by thoughtful planning, by understanding the capacity needs of the, uh, for development and implementation. It's being thoughtful with regard to protecting uh, proper planning by protecting the tribal government with regard to how they are using the funds. One of the big things that we're seeing, Jason, is that tribes uh, that, that aren't entering into pro to proper planning are seeing significant cost overruns, number one, in their projects because the way that they were budgeted was using to, uh, historical numbers, not future numbers based upon supply chain crisis and a lack of getting supplies in a timely manner and the increase of cost of staffing. All these things contribute to delays as well as increased cost. We're seeing a, a project that, uh, give you an example in a community, um, had, had considered a, a large construction project. And, and so they allocated uh, ARPA funds for that construction project. So challenge number one is before you use your ARPA, and I'll get, get back to ARPA's gold, it's a universal currency, you could use it for construction, but there is a lot of other funding opportunities that could pay for that project before you have to use your ARPA funds. So that's number one. So that's first yellow flag. The second yellow flag is, they used historical planning techniques in order to develop their planning and budgeting moving forward. And at the tribal council uh, meeting, they, uh, they uh, had brought through resolution to adopt this project and move this forward. And it was a very large project for the community. And right before the vote was taken, the architect was in the back of the room and he asked to approach the council. And he says, the uh, uh, tribal council, I, like you to reconsider before you take this vote because we completed the estimates 90 days ago to do this project. We can tell you today that the cost to do this project is 48% more than was estimated 90 days ago and it's gonna take you twice as long. So if in fact the community would have gone forward and invested their, their precious ARPA dollars in this project and it was basically the extent of their ARPA dollars, they would have ended up with a project that was cost overrun twice what it was supposed to be and it was gonna be half finished. So that was not a positive process, right? That planning process didn't take into consideration of, wait a minute, we've gotta be thoughtful in how we're going to approach these. We gotta protect our nation with regard to cost overruns and, and access to the funding and our capacity requirements to actually do it. But then the second is, Let's look at all other alternate funds before we use our precious ARPA monies that could very well have paid for that project. So the strategy in summary is a tiered approach that protects the nation, that addresses capacity requirements necessary to actually implement, accesses all the funding sources, not just kind of historically what you've you know, been limited to, and, and overall, uh, I believe it have a much significant uh, more of an impact to the community. So thank you. Uh, really good laying that out, John. Thank you. Um, Chairman Vivanka, when you think about that strategy of kind of protecting that direct distribution funds, um, <clears throat> because it is the least restrictive, right? And going after kind of that middle tier, did, did, did you follow a, a, a similar approach when you, when you um, looked at your strategy for ARPA funding? We have, and, and, and more specifically, uh, recently with our wastewater treatment facility, you know, we had always planned for that to be a, a major project for our reservation and our housing needs. Uh, but because of, of inflation, uh, material and time uh, expenditures with just the increase of, of cost, we've had to relook at that. And there's opportunity out there where you can use hopefully state funding or infrastructure bill funding to connect to local communities and, and their infrastructure uh, wastewater management systems and there's an opportunity for those to be funded through these grants that's something that we really got to look at because it takes away from the having to, to operate own and operate your own treatment facility manage it down the road with all the regulations all the potential new um, employees and whatnot it just really looking at those and analyzing them and making sure you're using the best maximum use of these dollars and getting your the best bang for your buck in a sense yeah 
really good. <clears throat> Thanks, Chairman. Uh, if we go to the next slide, just to kind of hit that point home on the strategy again, just to re recap, you know, protect fiscal recovery funds, right? That's the direct distribution, it's the least restrictive, there's years for use there. And really focus on leveraging those program specific funds as both John and Chairman talked about, um, whether those be allocation based, formula based, application based, competitive, state funding. <clears throat> but this is the largest opportunity to really expand funding opportunity um, to be able to grow that. And you wanna you know, use those program funds first. And so really important when you talk about that strategy. Um, let's dive a little bit just kind of into planning. And Jamie, when we talk about planning, we can go to the next slide. Um, you know, some tribes, there's so much funding out there, and yet it's still not enough, right, for the, for the needs for each of the communities that we work with. One thing I know as we travel and work with these communities, Jamie, is that the needs far outweigh even this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So how do you keep from, you know, just chasing funding, I guess, because there's so much funding out there, it can be overwhelming, and different departments might, might chase funding, We've always kind of talked about maybe trying to lead with, um, you know, kind of key council and tribal leadership initiatives. So maybe talk a little bit about why you think that approach is 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 better or best for planning and how to, you know, kind of plan using these seven key funding areas uh, moving forward. Thank you, Jason. You know, when it comes to any tribal system. It always, the, the buck stops at the tribal council and the tribal elected leaders. So it really becomes important for leadership to be not only involved in planning, but to lead planning on the priorities that are most important to the tribe now and to develop a vision for what they would like to see going forward. Now, as it relates to ARPA and, and looking at this slide, you know, these seven categories that we've developed over the last couple of years are really tied to the ARPA direct funding. And, you know, uh, because of the, the impacts of the pandemic in tribal communities, these are the, the core areas that Treasury and, and, and the different uh, agencies within the federal government have prioritized as areas to support with the ARPA direct funds and the non-ARPA direct fund or non-direct ARPA funds. And so really looking at from a tribal leadership perspective, the uh, developing a plan that deals with addressing the here and now impacts of, of the pandemic and recovery, then taking the time to actually look forward. And you know, we suggest, especially because of the time frame of the funds, over the next one to three years for the, for the use of the ARPA uh, direct funds and the infrastructure funds over the next one to five years. And then really looking at the, the timelines on the grant funding. When it boils down to from a, from a planning perspective is looking at the core funds of, these aren't in any order as far as ranking, but infrastructure, housing, culture and language, economic development, community development, public health, education. Most of what a tribal government is trying to develop and build for protecting its sovereignty, protecting its people, protecting its culture and its lifeways is tied into these seven buckets. That's very important because it also allows tribal leaders to think about not just the use of the ARPA funds, but the bigger picture of what they want to achieve for their people in protecting the future. So we really look at in our planning process with tribes, taking the time to prioritize what are the major projects that are either on the table or that the tribal council would like to put on the table that falls in these areas so that they can be prioritized to go out and seek additional funding. And, 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 and being very prudent about it because although uh, there is, um, there's time to, to continue to do it, as John brought up, there's you know 90 potential grants to the end of the year and 1.5 billion on the table just in the here and now. And that's not even with the other grants that are going to be coming out. And we see every month new grant funds coming out. So it really becomes important, not only for the leadership to plan and prioritize, but to also include the, the 
the uh, uh, departments and programs and economic arms to get their involvement and also get perspective from the membership. You know, the stakeholders, the, the, the purpose of a tribal government is to serve its people ultimately. And so getting perspective from the people about what the priorities are as you go forward and being able to develop priorities to address those. And then from there building projects that are based on the here and now immediate projects, the projects that are going to take some time to, to advance and plan for, and then for the future, having a vision for the next leaders that come in and for the people to see that there's a direction that you're going in is a critical path. One thing I will say about the use of the funds is it's also a time right now to think of what are the opportunities to partner as Chairman Vivanka brought up? What opportunities is there for the tribe to partner in the region and really, really maximize leveraging those state allocated funds, bringing a pool of funds, maybe the local town, local county, local district, and or, or maybe the local chamber of commerce, whatever that is, in most cases, to build the tribal economy, the tribe has to include the neighborhood around them to as because they're going to be part of their customer base, if not the majority of their customer base. So really including them in the planning, not not as a as a request, but as a good partner, as a good neighbor, as a as a strong leader in the region. So would want to have that as part of this overarching planning process. Um, but taking the time to really break that down, as John pointed out, of what are the impacts of us developing a wastewater plant? What are the impacts of us putting in another 100 houses? What are the impacts of us building a school for our people, both good and bad? Making, taking the time to weigh those out and then including what workforce development is needed to create tribal member jobs for the future. So that would be the big picture of this process. And that would all be drilled down into specific details on each of these seven core focus areas. And, and then projects for each of those detailed goals that are set by leadership. And that would include budgeting, that would include you know, impacts on staffing and, and impacts for the future. Yeah. yeah, I think Jamie had some excellent point. And, and, uh, in many cases, the planning actually identifies the projects and the needs for additional support. I'll give you a couple examples on this on this slide. Three of them. I'll, I'll just use public and community health as one. There's more money for health projects there's ever been in Indian country, and as we all know, there's a dire need for it. But uh, under Kate Grismala from our team and and her staff is is really looking at health assessments of the community members. Right? What what is their health needs? Where are they in, in their, in, in their uh, requirements for, for quality health? What are the services that are needed that maybe aren't provided today? What's the assessment of current clinic operations? Are they up to what you need in your community? Uh, not only from staffing, but efficiency and third party billing and, and are they efficient operations? And if there's gaps, you know, th this is the time to identify is there a potential expansion of a clinic, right? And what that could look like. And, and those are projects that could be paid for under this process. Um, and then looking at healthcare for profit, we believe at Bluestone that leveraging sovereign rights in healthcare for tribal communities is a tremendous opportunity for financial stability and better healthcare uh, for community members. And so is that being considered both on the economic side as well as on the, the health side? And then if you, if you look at, you know, human resources, as we talked about, Alicia Finley and our, and our staff oversees several or many uh, projects related to compensation assessments, right? One thing that we're seeing in the gaps I mentioned earlier is what the, the, the gap between able to recruit and retain quality staff. And, and that is a challenge in Indian country as it is across all of the US today. So what is it that needs to be looked at to better retain, train and attract strong uh, staff members to your, for, to your government operations? That is something that's a viable expense and 
should be thoughtful in this process. And then if I look at economic development, the need for revenue is greater than ever right now. Revenue to pay for government services, to, to be say, uh, uh, sustainable and, and, and create workforce development and, and, and job opportunities for your members. And so, you know, Kevin Blazer on the Economic Development Services Director, you know, their team's looking at what industries could be considered now that the pandemic has really had an effect on the economy what are the opportunities for tribal sovereignty to leverage through taxation and land use and, and so forth and funding? So these planning approaches actually lead to identification of critical projects that could then be paid for through implementation of these different funding agents. So thank you, uh, Jason. Yeah, thanks, John. If we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so just kind of an example of, you know, kind of what that would, you know, produce when you think about instead of just chasing the funding, starting with really kind of leadership's, you know, kind of key areas of focus. And here's kind of a case study of how some of those things, now these aren't projects, right? These are just kind of, you know, high level <clears throat> kind of goals. These kind of will waterfall down into several projects and there'll be a lot of planning to get those projects um, kind of mapped out and to get them shovel ready. Um, but Chairman um, Vivanco, you went through a similar process. How important was it to kind of lead with, you know, kind of um, leadership's, you know, goals, I think, to be able to really talk about how you would address the, foot, the ARPA opportunity. I think it's extremely important. And uh, you identify this slide. <clears throat> In our tribe, we took the, the same, the very same approach. We as a council sat together for, uh, it wasn't even hours, but days and weeks, and identified future need, current needs, future needs, and just where we anticipate our tribe going in the next 5, 10, 25 years and what the needs may be. We put all that down on paper, just as you have a, a slide here that shows us such, and really identified from there, what are our priorities? Once you identify those priorities, the funding opportunities that are out there, uh, you know, we went and hired a second grant writer to help us identify those areas and see what's gonna be available to us and what was the most uh, feasible. Start chipping away at that and then aim for the aim for the ultimate goal, you know, and, and creating a community that is self-sustainable, uh, making sure that you have addressed all of your tribe's current and future needs or just identifying them at least. And then just really going out there and, and sticking to your plan, sticking to your model, making sure that this is your, 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 your Bible, so to speak. And you can turn back and look at it and what else can we address? Once you cr create that and, and improve upon it, I think you'll find success in that and, and going after these funds and identifying the specific dollars that are out there for what may be on your list. It's something that we're doing, we continue to do. Um, just because we went through it one time doesn't mean that we don't think of something down the road and don't add it, we do that. And uh, we just continue to build upon that to make sure that we're addressing all of our future needs and all of our future goals. So. I think it's very important to sit down, uh, have a working council session. Uh, like I said, it may not be one or two, but multiple and over some time, but addressing all your needs. Yeah, really good. Thanks, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Melissa, if we can skip the next slide and go to the, the one after that so we can talk about the process really quick. Um, <clears throat> when we think about you know this approach with phase one really being that of establishing those leadership goals, um, but John, we saw that slide of all those leadership goals, but how have just in your practice and working with tribes, how has that turned into kind of projects, moving those into really kind of projects that can actually, you know, seek grant funding opportunities? I think the chairman did an excellent job of recapping the importance of, of gaining alignment. The key word here is alignment with tribal council. And, and uh, so having a, you know, at Bluestone, we believe in a, in a work session environment, two day work session as an example. And uh, we interview the individual tribal leaders to gain what their priorities in the seven buck funding buckets, what you saw the slide earlier, what are the, the top three and four goals that they would like to accomplish? And we collect that data and we have a working session and we go through a facilitated discussion of prioritizing individual uh, projects, individual goals, what the impact could be, what the funding opportunities at a high level could be. And out of that comes the top three to four goals in each of the seven categories. So you just do quick math, that's anywhere from 21 to 28 goals 
the tribal councils across Indian country that we work with feel that those are want, they either want to move forward with those and get funding and, and see how they can really see these projects into reality. And so then at that point, um, the tribal council assigns point of contacts within the department of programs, departments or programs, excuse me, that, that are assigned specific goals to turn those into projects. And so at, at uh, Bluestone, we have a process, it's called a, a project priority worksheet. And we work with the points of contact and develop what are the projects, what are they defined as, what do they look like, what are they, what, what planning has already been done or has it started that is going to accomplish the, the council goal. So get a clear list of the projects necessary, whether they've been pre-identified or not, that are going to be necessary to accomplish what the tribal council just laid out. And to give you an idea, 21, pro, uh, 21 tribal uh, council goals usually turns into between 80 and 90 projects. So now you've got 80 to 90 projects and now you, and then they come back for approval to council. So now council says, here's my goals that we want to accomplish, working with the POCs and the Bluestone team, here is specifically the projects that are necessary to actually see our goals become a reality for our people. Some communities ask for community input to those projects to make sure there's alignment between stakeholders of the council and community and, and staff. And then it's moved forward with phase two. And phase two is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, it, if you think about moving you know, 15 to 25 projects through a government system historically, and now you're looking at anywhere from 80 to 90 projects with three times the amount of grants funding sources, you've got a complicated model. And I'd like to use the hourglass, right? You start at the top of the hourglass is the big funnel. And you have all these opportunities that go into it. And, uh, and then at the bottom is, is all the funding opportunities that are available to source those. But the, 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 the small part of the funnel is the bottleneck. And the bottleneck has to really address capacity, address structured planning, cost controls that protect the community, capacity requirements on staffing, et cetera. And so the planning process that, that we've identified in, in our working with tribes, take all that data and put it into a document that's between six and 10 pages per project. And it basically represents about 80% of everything that the grant writer needs to actually go pursue the project. So historically grant writers, you know, move from department to department to try to collect data. So in this case, they're given, here's the project priority, here's the goal of the council, and here's the planning document that addresses 80% of what you need to actually go get that award. And that's where we're seeing the success. That's where we're seeing, you know, historically 15 to 25 projects move through the planning process to seeing 80 to 90 move through the process in an efficient, timely manner. And it takes engagement and support from tribal council. It takes engagement from the grants department, but it also takes engagement from the points of contact at the project or, or program level. And the awards, uh, we're looking at a tribe that received, I'll just give you an example, a small amount, I wanna emphasize the word small amount of ARPA funds. They're now pursuing over $100 million in federal non-ARPA and state funds to fund their projects and using this strategy. And I could use that across various different sizes of communities, but this is the approach that widens the funnel of the hourglass in the favor of the community. Wires, wi widens the hourglass to protect the community through a structured planning process. And the result is greater awards, greater efficiency, and the ability to actually implement the projects that the council decides to move forward on. Really good. Thanks, John. <clears throat> we got a couple minutes left. And so Chairman Vivanco, and I think about, you know, you've made a commitment, um, your tribe's made a commitment to planning and to really getting things in place and moving um, these, um, you know, projects forward. So <clears throat> now that you made that commitment to planning, just five years from now, as you look back, when you look back five years from now, you know, what would you hope that you would have accomplished? What would success look like um, for you and, and the Saboba tribe? I think 
address that in five years i would have hoped we would have addressed our needs you know and we uh housing being one of the biggest making sure that we have um opportunities for members to build homes and live on the reservation uh that's our biggest goal right now and i think uh you know if my tribe or even indian country as a whole if we um capitalize on the opportunities in front of us uh it's, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity and if we uh fulfill the needs of our communities and and look to grow i think it's it's a success um it's up to us and it's up to us alone to, to work together as as one uh with uh contractors consultants with the u.s government and making sure that we maximize the opportunity and seize it seize the opportunity to, to create for our community. So I think there's a lot of opportunity out there, be it infrastructure, be it broadband, be it housing, be it wherever your need may be. Um, it's a win if we go out and use these dollars to its maximum use potential. Um, if we have to turn around and, and give back $1 to the federal government, I think it's a loss. So. Wow, really good words, Chairman, thank you. Yeah, Melissa, if you could pull up our um, just contact info slide. Um, and then Jamie, as we close out, just if, uh, if anyone's interested in maybe going through a similar, you know, process that, um, the chairman and John and yourself have described today, maybe what's the kind of the next step if they haven't really done much planning yet, especially around ARPA and they'd like to get started, any kind of recommendations on first steps? Yeah, I think, you know, first and foremost, the leadership should come together and, and look about what, uh, start with what remaining ARPA funds do you have? Most tribes have committed resources already to, at this point, but many tribes still have some that are unobligated and they're looking to determine how best to prioritize the use of those funds. So I think that's the starting place and definitely recommend um, you know, whether, whether you use an outside uh, support or professional like Bluestone or, or able to do it internally. As the chairman brought up, it isn't a sit down and plan one time exercise. This is a process that's going to take several meetings of the minds to come together to unify your priorities, to align with one another, to get your community's perspective on what's, what's a priority to them. And then also to develop a vision for uh, for the future. And that's the, really the, I think what I heard from chairman is that call to, do, to action around, you know, it's it's your responsibility as as executives, as, as program heads, as participants in the tribe and as tribal leaders to really, you know, be a champion of the process. And some people are going to be the ones that bring it to the table. Other ones are going to, are be the ones that that build it into a plan and other ones are going to implement and it's going to take everybody's engagement and involvement for it to be successful and it isn't it isn't a uh, uh a finish line opportunity it's you're developing a next stage of of um, stability for your community past the pandemic and ultimately have the opportunity to develop a plan for not only stabilizing but rebuilding and, and growing your tribal economy in the future. And so that's that's definitely the recommendation. As far as Bluestones, we recommend that, as John brought up, an initial two-day work session to bring the leaders together. And from there, it can be developed of, you know, the priorities turn into these 60 plans and we feel like we can achieve 15 of them and we want, you know, action agendas put to each of those 15 priorities. That's that's what we do. That's what Bluestone's done for 16 years before the pandemic and during the pandemic and beyond the pandemic. But to, to those of you that are looking to do it internally, that first step is really looking at what funds you have available from ARPA, looking at what grant writing skill sets you have internally, and seeing where your gaps are to be able to manage new grants and and, and write new grants, because that's probably the first stage is really bringing in that uh, grant writing support to, to help you write new grants and, and that are out there. And the other is to really look at prioritizing what can be done now and what needs to be staged as part of this process. 
projects. And, and really those are our key fundamental pieces to this puzzle. And from there, it's really not just, it's a living document as the chairman brought up. Some things will come off and other things will be brought up. And that's really the idea of a strong um, action plan is really that it's, it's not set in stone it's made to, to evolve and it's, it's made to adjust, as, but to stay the course on your overarching vision and your overarching priorities uh, at the leadership level. <clears throat> thank you so much, Jamie. And thank you to all panelists, John. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for joining today. Just such a good, valuable insight. And thank you for your um, um, strong leadership in Indian country. And uh, we've got um, a survey <clears throat> that I think we're going to send at the end here, right? Is that is that right, Melissa? Uh, it should pop up automatically once we're done, as well as in a follow-up email tomorrow. Okay, great. So it'll pop up. If you could take stay and take that survey, I'd really appreciate it. If not, it'll pop up as a follow-up email. If we can support in any way, please um, let us know. We'd be happy to. And thank you for everyone's time today. And best of luck in navigating um, this this windfall of um, federal opportunity, and hopefully you're encouraged um, and inspired to make the most of it um, this morning. So thank please, you. Please please reach out to Bluestone if we can be a support resource. We'd be honored. Hands up to all of you.